Well, good morning, everyone. I'm sure that for many of you in the room, the pleasure of this meeting is actually just in seeing your friends and seeing the DCO community. And so as I launch into the achievements uh, and the quantification of carbon in the convecting mantle, uh, it's uh, appropriate to mention that there's one community member whose absence is acutely felt, I think, at this meeting. I'm, of course, talking about Eric Howery. He's depicted here with uh, Marion Le Voyer, who is a postdoc, uh, who is a postdoc, uh, who is shared between Carnegie and the Smithsonian. And reservoirs and fluxes, you know, so much of what happened was Eric's vision. And it is no exaggeration to say that none of what I'm presenting here today would have happened without Eric. Uh, and he is deeply missed by all the authors and I'm sure everyone in the room. But there are many other people, two early career DCO uh, community members here, Jonathan Tucker, Kay Shimizu, who are here in the audience. Reach out to them, say hi. I thank them for the work and their contributions uh, to this talk and everybody uh, who contributed to making this massive uh, amount of work possible. I'm going to be talking to you about the quantification of carbon in the convecting mantle. That's the part of the Earth that's sampled by ocean islands and mid-ocean ridges and back arc basins. I was lucky enough to be part of what I think was the very first proposal to reservoirs and fluxes with Eric Howery. And I think it was the first proposal because it seemed the, the most, such an obvious thing to do, which was to create a carbon inventory of oceanic basalts and the oceanic upper mantle. We wrote that this effort will begin an analytical program to measure directly and map the carbon flux from the mantle to Earth's surface via the global mid-ocean ridge system using international collections. So we have to work with the samples that Earth gives us in these sampling locations. We need to quantify the carbon in basalts in the matrix glass, in the glassy melt inclusions, there's shrinkage bubbles, bubbles in the matrix, and even in the uh, nominally and carbonaceous minerals, um, like olivine. This is made difficult by the fact that carbon solubility in silicate melts is very low. And so what I'm showing here is a schematic of uh, mid-ocean ridge. It's erupting underwater, so it's erupting at pressure. This is pressure on the y-axis. And along the x-axis, I have trace element concentration. Carbon in this, in this presentation, carbon is just another trace element. Okay? And what you're seeing here is the CO2 saturation surface. So if you want to quantify carbon in a melt unadulterated from its primary concentration, you might select a very depleted uh, composition, one with low carbon concentrations, low trace element concentrations, so that carbon nucleates late in that melt, uh, vapor bubbles nucleate late. And you might choose to sample very deep in the ocean under the highest pressures possible. By this means, you might have a scent of a uh, magma with its carbon concentration and trace element concentration intact and unaltered. Another way you could do this, if you had a more enriched melt or a shallower ridge, would be to take your melt and before a CO2 bubble nucleated, encase your melt in a shell of olivine. And that strong shell maintains pressure on the melt such that the melt can't degas until it, re uh, it can't degas. And then you might arrive with a melt inclusion in the olivine with no shrinkage bubble, and you'd have a CO2 undersaturated melt to analyze. Of course, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, melts arrive at the surface CO2 oversaturated, and that's because of the slow kinetics of CO2 diffusing into vapor bubbles. What happens in these scenarios is you have your trace element concentration and your CO2 concentration. You saturate in CO2, you nucleate your first bubble, the carbon concentration in the melt falls as all the CO2 goes into the bubble, and the trace element concentration um, is, is fine. The trace element uh, stays at its uh, initial concentration. And here I'm just showing that for any uh, sample pressure where you pick up your basalt off the sea floor, if you compare it to the saturation pressure, the vast majority are oversaturated no matter what model you use. And this is, of course, evidenced by the fact that mid-ocean ridge basalts are just full of vesicles. They're full of CO2 bubbles. <laughs> 
So primary and trace element concentrations, uh, primary trace element concentrations and CO2 concentrations become decoupled in the vast majority of cases. So to complete our triptych on the left here, you have the case of ocean island basalts. Here we show the CO2 concentration falling all the way to zero as you erupt subaerially. And in these cases, you really need to rely on those olivine hosted melt inclusions and even reintegrate the CO2 shrinkage bubble into your melt concentrate, into your melt composition to reconstruct the CO2 concentration of those melts. So the underlying methodological assumption here that pervades all the work I'll be presenting today is that carbon's concentration will track other highly incompatible elements so long as carbon has not begun to degas. What's amazing here is that two decades ago, there were only two localities on the planet where we inferred carbon undersaturated uh, concentrations, the famous popping rock, where the vesicles were reintegrated into the melt composition, and Sekiros, where uh, Alberto Sal and Eric Howery found CO2 undersaturated melt inclusions. And you can see them here. They're the ones where CO2 is correlated with niobium. Okay, so they're correlated, they're behaving the same, they're behaving coherently because they're both just acting as incompatible trace elements. The rest of MORB, and here's popping rock up here, the rest of MORB, uh, this correlation is broken because of degassing. So the CO2 concentration has fallen, whereas the niobium concentration remains unaltered. Today, we have dozens of locations, many, many localities with un where undersaturated melts have been found. And so this is just an amazing achievement of the last decade. Some of this work is uh, not related to DCO, but a lot of this work was uh, related to DCO efforts. And we see these beautiful correlations. Even at Iceland, uh, Eric published uh, in 2018 under CO2 undersaturated melt inclusions from Iceland, although this is extremely rare. So uh, we quantified carbon concentrations for six plumes, six ocean island basalts. Uh, this is um, Jonathan Tucker's work and uh, Marsky and Howery. And while they, the CO2 has partially degassed from these melt inclusions, they were able to reconstruct the CO2 concentrations to the best, the best of our ability. So now looking at all, all the data that's come out in the last decade, we see a beautiful correlation here between CO2 and barium. Uh, we could choose many highly incompatible elements. Barium seems uh, to have a very constant ratio. Uh, all, these, all these samples fall on a single line, so that ratio of CO2 to barium is very constant. And these are sampling locations around the globe, uh, across the mantle, okay? And then we can see uh, where CO2 has degassed and samples that fall off of this correlation. And so again, the idea here is that we have a constant CO2 barium ratio in the mantle with some error, some slop, but we can infer for these degassed melts that their carbon concentrations used to be up on this line. They've lost carbon, but we can use their barium concentration to infer their initial CO2 concentration. That's the game we're playing in all of these studies. So the constancy of CO2 barium and CO2 rubidium ratios in undegas samples, and the similarity of carbon, rubidium, and barium incompatibility in experiments, um, and these experiments were also conducted, these are uh, Mark, Mark Hirschman's lab, also in collaboration with Eric Howery. The similarity in experimental studies gives us a lot of confidence that barium and rubidium will be very suitable proxies for reconstruction of primary undegassed CO2. There are some potential problems. I don't, need to, I don't have time to talk about them in a 10 minute talk, conveniently. Um, but I will add though that uh, these, uh, anyone can ask me questions about them. I think that barium uh, incorporation from plagioclase is not a big deal. And I would say that partial degassing is possible and it can't be ruled out. Um, but it's certainly not required to explain the data, and that came out in a really nice paper by Kei Shimizu just this year. So the takeaway message, we're going to use barium and rubidium uh, for, as proxies for MORB, and because these trace elements vary on the planet by greater than a factor of 20, that can't be explained by ridge processes, by partial melting processes. And many trace elements, these highly incompatible trace elements, correlate with a lot of radiogenic isotopes. So we infer mantle heterogeneity. Thus, by analogy with trace elements, 
we anticipate variations in mantle carbon due to mantle heterogeneity. So if you use trace element concentrations now, and so you don't need to find ND gas morbid every, at every segment, you need to have good constraints on the trace element concentrations. And we have 387 segments where we think that's the case. And so for those 387 segments, we can inf infer, calculate the primary CO2 concentration. And when you do that, you get this data set with uh, its uh, a very skewed distribution, nearly a log normal distribution with a medium of median of 1,100 parts per million CO2. But a mode, a most common, you know, go, go to the ridge, pick up a rock, a most common CO2 concentration, primary CO2 concentration of 620 parts per million. This allowed us uh, to take those 387 segments and then by means of those statistics I just showed you, project what the carbon concentration of every single segment uh, is most uh, likely to be around the globe for all 711 mid-ocean mid ridge segments in the Gale catalog. The ones constrained uh, with uh, data have a range of CO2 from 104 parts per million to nearly two weight percent. And then Marion Le Voyer went a step further. Okay, so looking at crustal thickness as a function of ridge depth, okay? Looking at the correlation between seismically determined ridge crust, crustal thicknesses and, and ridge depth from the Gale catalog, she was able to create a relationship that allowed her to extrapolate, okay, the, the, the crustal thickness for every segment on the planet. And of course, um, the crustal, um, the seismic constraint catalog comes from Mark Bain, who's another member uh, in the audience from the DCO community. So with this, we have a lot of power because we can now calculate a global flux because we have magma productivity. And we get 1.3 times 10 to the 12th moles per year. What I think is great about this is that this translates to 58 teragrams per year. It, it's, uh, I swear we did not work together at all. I mean, we worked together, but the 59 teragrams a year from Jonathan Tucker's uh, noble gas um, constraints uh, was a completely independent project. And it's actually very similar to the 53 teragrams of, a year in the Keller, Katz, and Hirschman study from EPSL 2017 using a completely different um, methodology. And so I feel like DCO like really stuck a pin in it here, you know, about the carbon flux from Earth's mantle to the exosphere. We can also take these uh, primary CO2 concentrations and uh, do the back calculation to get uh, through the batch melting equation to get to the mantle concentration. And so we also mapped mantle concentrations of CO2 around the globe. And when you do that, you get uh, these data here with a median of 100 parts per million and a mode or a most commonly found CO2 concentration of 73 parts per million. And you can compare this to a lot of other um, work that's been done. This is lower than some and higher than others. And so as we look uh, at this uh, decade of achievements, uh, in this 10-year period, in a series of nearly a dozen papers, we've quantified the CO2 concentrations of more than 1,500 ocean basalts and melt inclusions, constrained primary magmatic CO2 of segments where we have trace element data, inferred uh, the rest, calculated a CO2 flux, estimated CO2 for uh, six major oceanic hotspots, spots, and estimated mantle CO2. And I would just close by saying that Eric pursued and achieved the goals that he set out uh, just through his relentless excellence. Thank you. Thanks for this great talk. Uh, we have time for questions. If no one has a question for me, I have a question for the audience. <laughs> if you were one of the early career gentlemen who approached me at the reception last night and asked if I could bring a soccer ball to the meeting today, I have done so. Please find me at the coffee break and I will deliver the soccer ball to you, freshly inflated. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>